Hello again, fellow audiophiles. I am Wave Theory, and today's review is a long-awaited one. It is of the Meze 109 Pro. This is a full-size, open-back, dynamic driver headphone. This was a kind loan to me from Apos Audio, who is currently selling this headphone at its MSRP of 800 US dollars. Uh, Apos has made no attempt to influence my opinion on this piece in one way or the other. All they ask for is a fair and honest evaluation, which I'm about to give, and then an affiliate link down in the description. So the link that you will see where you can buy this to, uh, from Apos in the description below will be an affiliate link. If you like what you hear from this review and you are interested in buying this headphone, please consider using that affiliate link down below and I will get a few bucks back to help keep this channel going and bring you more content. All right, um, I have uh, some disclaimers to make beyond that, some biases to declare about Meze headphones, um, which I will talk more about on the other side of shameless self-promotion. Um, also, this review is going to be on the long side, and so I'm going to explain why, um, explain what all of the chapters are, what some of the basic takeaways are, and then timestamp uh, this video thoroughly so that you can jump around and watch the points of most interest to you right after this, because there is a lot of hype around this headphone. And so should we all jump aboard that hype train? Okay, let's explore that together right after shameless self-promotion. Hi, I'm Wave Theory's Human Companion, and he wants you to know that your support of this YouTube channel helps keep the reviews coming. If you enjoy Wave Theory's honest, thorough style, then make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and check out the links in the description below to sign up for the Patreon or send him a tip through PayPal. All right, enjoy the musings. So as I mentioned in the intro, this review is gonna be on the long side, and there are a couple of reasons for that. One of the reasons is this is the third Meze headphone I have reviewed on this channel. The first was the Meze Elite, which is their, I think, 4,000 US dollar flagship model. And then I reviewed the Lyric, which is their $2,000 planar closed back. Uh, and let's just say that sonically, anyway, Meze has a lot to prove to me, or at least they had a lot to prove to me coming into this review because I was a bit underwhelmed with the Elite. The Elite is fine, it doesn't sound bad, just in my humble and listened opinion at this point, I did not think that it offered technical performance that was anywhere near its $4,000 asking uh, price. And like, yes, it was beautiful aesthetically. Yes, it is amazingly well built and very comfortable, but there are other headphones that pull off that same feat, but also bring the sonic technical performance along with it. And when I say technical performance here, like uh, that also to me does imply listening enjoyment because it is the sum of the technicalities and how they're presented and all of that. And like the way they scale up with price that is in some ways connected with uh, listening enjoyment, at least that it is for me. And I didn't think the Elite brought brings it sonically, okay? uh, at least not for $4,000. And it's not a case where it's like, okay, maybe it's $3,000, but it's $1,000 worth of build. It's not even that. Like, it's like it falls way off the pace with the Susvaras, the Utopias, the Final D8000s, the LCD5s, you know, like those uh, headphones of the world that are like up there in that price, the HE1000s, you know, those, those kinds of things. It just it falls behind those, uh, both in raw performance and in the price per performance uh, metrics. And you know, and, and so forth. So I have a full review of the Elite. I will link to that down below. The Lyric was just an awful mess. I did not like that headphone at all. And honestly, it was probably my least favorite reviewed product. The one I just completely didn't like the most until maybe the Hi-Fi Men Audivina came along. And that one is duking it out with the Lyric for worst product I have ever reviewed, okay? So that's where I stand with Meze on this. And I keep hearing just the overwhelming hype train about the 109 Pro here. People are saying that it punches way above its weight. 
okay it's just like it it's just lauded and praised and just like i said the hype train on this one has fully left the station should it have is one of the questions that i'm asking given my experience with meze previously so i want to be fair uh, in this review and as honest as I can be as I always try to be and so this review just ended up ballooning and being very long because there's a lot of ground to cover here um, there are some aspects about this headphone that it gets very right and then there are others that it doesn't okay and so and then I'm going to save the question of like should we get on that hype train um, for the very end, but some of the other main points here, and again, I'm going to timestamp all this out so that you can jump around. Some of the main points here are very easy to drive and somewhat mobile friendly. Okay. So we'll unpack that here, at least as, as far, uh, as mobile friendly as an open back can be. We'll get to that in a, in a moment here. Okay. Other things that we will talk about the build quality is exquisite. The, uh, the aesthetic exquisite. The cabling system is bad, okay? Uh, at least the stock cables are bad, and the recessed jacks here create a problem, an additional problem beyond the cables being bad. So we'll unpack all of that in a moment as this uh, unfolds as well. Sonically, this is my favorite Meze so far, okay? Uh, and I will explain more about what it actually sounds like and what it means for me to say that it's my fav favorite Meze so far on the heels of me having just disclaimed to you that I have not really liked the mezes that I have had experience with up to this point. Okay, because there is a lot of room between my experience, you know, like my favorite sounding meze and is it actually price appropriate or punching above its weight? There's a big gap there. Where does this actually fall, okay, on that spectrum? We'll get to that in the sound section. Okay, so, then I'm going to be to help answer that question, honestly, like where does it fall in that spectrum that I just described? I have a plethora of headphones that I directly compared this against. And so I'll just hold them up here, timestamp this out so you can jump there if you want to. One of them is the Aurorus Borealis. Okay. Another is the Focal Elex. Right. And then I have three Hi-Fi Men's that fell in there. We have the Ananda Stealth Magnet Edition. I broke out the HE6SE V2 for this, and then also the Aria Stealth Magnet Edition. I compared the 109 Pro to all five of these. One, two, three, four, five, yes, five. Okay, um, all five of these individually to try to really get a sense of where this thing, the 109 Pro, lands in the market and to see if all of the hype surrounding this is uh, accurate or not. So again, timestamps, jump around as you need uh, to uh, learn all of that, and then otherwise get comfy because we're gonna be here a while. Okay, quickly the specs. Dynamic driver here that uh, Meze calls their dual diaphragm. So it's a composite of materials. There's beryllium in there. There's some carbon fiber in there. There's like kind of a paper composite material in there. So a lot of thought and development went into the dynamic driver here in terms of how it is made. It is a very efficient and easy to drive driver. Okay, uh, it's the rated impedance on these things is 40 ohms, and then the rated sensitivity is 112 decibels per milliwatt at one kilohertz. So that's not super high in impedance, and that's very highly sensitive for a full-size headphone. They are quite easy to drive. You'll have no problems driving these with a dongle DAC or a DAP or something like that if you want to use these in a transportable situation where you travel with them and set up in a hotel room or whatever it is that you want to do there. Okay, they are amplifier friendly in terms of their drivability for sure. One aspect of it that does help with that transportable nature, not really on the go or portable because open back, I don't think you want to use these outside very much, particularly if you live in a windy area, you could pop a driver, okay? But it comes with this nice, okay, kind of semi-hard shell carrying case right here, which has a decent enough profile that you can toss this in a backpack or a suitcase, all that, travel with it, keep the headphones safe, and then when you get to your hotel room, you know, or head fire or, or can jam or whatever it is you're going, you can set this up 
use it fairly easily in that way. So um, that is an ergonomic strength of this, um, I think. Okay, we're going to cut to a clip here where I show you the build of this close up because again, it is very well built. It is very aesthetically striking in a good way, I think. It's also very comfortable. So I'm going to talk more about that in an overhead view clip here in just a moment uh, where I lay those things. And then I'm going to also unpack that cabling issue that I just mentioned because that is not an insignificant factor in the buying decision behind this headphone, I think. So let's cut to all of that. All right, on this overhead view, let's look at the build of the 109 Pro. And then I wanna talk about the cabling system here because I have a couple of comments to make about this. Uh, first thing we're gonna look at though, is just that we do in typical meze form here, we have pretty exquisite build quality. Like it looks great, the color scheme and all of that is unique and cool. We have the wood cup here, highly polished wood, almost feels like plastic, it's so smooth. Okay, but as far as I know, it is real wood. And then we have this, like I think they call it a spider or something or other. Anyway, on um, over the back grill here, we have the copper or bronze colored accents, all of that. We have these really cushy, soft, supple, velour ear pads and then we have a suspension strap headband system okay attaches all the way down here like this and then like there's a an elastic -y kind of okay spring loaded in fact you can see the elastic strap way back in there when i pull it all the way up but this is the the head size adjustment and so it automatically stretches and adjusts to fit your head when you put it on and it has like just the right amount of clamp where it's nice and comfortable but it also stays in place on the head well all right and uh, that sort of thing but i mean it is a really well built really gorgeous looking headphone which is typical of meze i really never had a problem with their aesthetic they they dare to be different in an often cool and interesting way and then also in their build quality and the ergonomic side of it in terms of like the fit and the comfort and all of that they get thumbs up all around um in their headphone line for those traits and that is no different here so there's that okay the cabling system we have a dual 3.5 millimeter cable entry on the headphone here. And so this is the left here. And the, the cable entry is like on the back half of the cup as it's sitting on your head. Okay, so it's on the back half of the cup. It is angled forward. So the cable does come out forward a little bit at an angle. Not a super steep angle, but it is there, uh, but it's also far enough back. So it doesn't fully avoid the, the cable resting on your shoulders feeling, if that's something that bothers you. Um, but then look at those jack recesses. Like that is a deep recess in there. Okay, and it's also angled in such a way that it's like, you've gotta be careful how you, uh, how you line up the plug to get it in there these recesses are on the small side. Okay, why does that matter? Stock cable, let's look at that. First of all, here's one of them. It comes with two. Notice how springy it is, okay? Um, it's got that like rubbery vinyl. It doesn't tangle, but it like loops back around on itself, has some memory. It's pretty easy to undo it, but then it's like kind of twisty, all of that. So it's got some springiness to it. You get two cables in the stock package. Both of them are single-ended, terminated in a 3.5 millimeter TRS on the amp end and dual 3.5 millimeter TS on the headphone end. So what differentiates the two cables from each other is their length. You get a three meter one, and look how kind of tangled and springy that is. Okay, you get a three meter one, and then this one right here is a meter and a half. And then they also include a 3.5 millimeter to 6.35 millimeter single ended adapter. Okay, in there as well. All right, again, springy in memory. So the ergonomic feel of the cables 
is not great. We do have this very thin barrel here, okay? And that fits these jack recesses just fine. And so there's the angle part of it that I'm talking about. And I will, when I'm on camera, if I remember, I will show this, what it looks like. I have it on. So again, you got to line it up right, get it in there. Okay. There's that. Okay, like so. Now, what's the big deal, you may ask, other than just look how this just doesn't lay flat or anything like that. What's the big deal? Uh, so controversy time. This cable sounds awful. It sounds bad. Okay. Um, wicked treble peak. I, when I first got this headphone out and plugged it in, I, uh, I, I had a heart cable sitting on my desk. Just grabbed that, plugged it in really quick. Heart cables fit, by the way. There's a heart cable. See that thin barrel on the, the TS connector there? Fits right in there. No problem. Okay, so you can use hearts, which is good because, um, one, those lay on the desk a lot better. You can tell that right away. Um, anyway, put the headphone on. And as I said in the intro, Meze sonically had some things to prove to me before I put this set on. So I was a bit skeptical as to what was going to happen, but I put the, the heart cable in there and played these. And I'm like, okay, that actually does sound pretty good. Okay. Um, just real, you know, initial impression on that. I was like, Hmm, this is probably going to be my favorite Meze. Spoiler alert. It is, but, um, sounded pretty good. And then later on, I went and grabbed one of these stock cables. I don't remember which one doesn't matter because they're identical other than length. And boy, did these things get irritatingly and painfully sharp and peaky in the treble. I mean, sibilant, fatiguing, piercing, painful, bleh, and then just like they're just, it lacked detail. It lacked the separation and all of that that I had noticed initially using the heart cable here. And I it, it was like, and then as soon as I switched back to the heart cable, didn't completely clear up. I mean, they're still a bit bright about which more in the sound here, but boy, they sounded a lot more smooth, a lot more natural, a lot more spatially accurate. And that wicked treble peak in there, like doesn't entirely disappear. Um, the brightness of this headphone is one of the features we're going to talk about here in the sound and more, but it is much, much more under control with the heart than it is the stock cable. Okay, so if you are going to buy this headphone, factor in the cost of an aftermarket cable. These are ergonomic crap. They are sonic crap. Um, Meze, we deserve better on the cables, period. Okay, uh, you need to put ears on that own, your own combo there and hear that these stock cables are harming the sound of your headphone, period. They just are, okay? Not acceptable. Okay. So then back to the jack recesses, right? If you pretty much have to buy an aftermarket cable, you're kind of limited to options because of the size and depth of these recesses. This is my Plus Sound X8 cable right here. It is about a $400 cable starting price. Uh, it came with my Focal Radiance, really makes my Focal Radiance sound great. Um, and that's why I have it, because uh, I bought my Radiance used and the owner bundled this with the package. So, uh, you know, I got this for much cheaper than it normally would be, but it's about a $400 uh, starting cost for a four foot length. And look at the headphone end connectors here. Okay, we have this nice long uh, extension there on the barrel before we get to the, you know, the plus sound branded part right there. These guys do fit, but just barely. Like they are clicking into place just as the barrel right here, this downward part of the barrel is making contact with the edge of the jack recess right there. This just barely fits 
even with all of that extra room right there, which I mean, I do have small ish hands, but that is nearly the width of my index finger. Okay. Almost as, as the, the length of it is almost as wide as my pinky there. Like there is some, some depth to that. And these just barely fit. Okay. But again, this cable starting cost, um, is fully half the price of the headphone. So it's really hard to say, yeah, go buy a Plus Sound X8 for this because now you're not talking about an $800 headphone, you're talking about a $1,200 headphone. And that's a completely different category of headphone to be talking about, okay? But these fit, like it, so that worked too. Another cable I have around, Corpse Grave Digger. This is a fairly popular aftermarket cable. Why? Because it's pretty good and it's not ridiculously expensive. It's like $215, I think, for a six foot length or a two meter length, basically, which I know some are gonna scoff at, but like as far as cable prices go, that's not terrible. These don't fit, okay? Just it, the jack recess here stops it. Well short, it doesn't go in much at all. Okay, so that one doesn't work. Uh, what else do I have over here? Antonio from Gladiator Cables sent me a clutch of his stuff lately, and so I've been like working on and listening to some of them, but not on the 109 Pro because, let's see, I think this is from his Caesar line. It's a pure silver conductor. I don't remember the exact model. Okay, but I can ask him about that and then put it in the comments or in the description below. That's not a huge diameter plug barrel right there, but it is if you're the 109 Pro, okay? Also, does not go in all the way, okay? So that one's out. This one does work. This is, I gotta look up the name here. This is a laver cable. It is a, uh, let's see. It is the Grand Line 4 Conductor 20 Aug um, for the Susvara or hi Feynman line. So it's, uh, it's, it's starting price here is 460 us dollars. This one does have the narrow barrel on there and these fit in. Somebody's going to freak out because I was about to plug the right into the left, but these fit in just fine. Okay. So the point that I'm making here, and this is something that you need to consider. And if I apologize if it feels like I'm going on and on and on in this segment here, I just wanted to show you this. Like, because I'm a reviewer, I have ended up just for various reasons collecting a bunch of dual 3.5 millimeter cables. Um, and this isn't even all of them because I still have a friend loaned to me and I'm still working on a. Um, a, uh, a Dana Cables Lazuli reference, which is off camera here. No, no way that one fits either. It's got big thick barrels on the uh, on the headphone plugs too, all that. So, I mean, that one's over there. And like, I mean, why do I have all of these? One, I mean, cables do make a difference, okay? I know it's popular out there to say that they don't and that it's somehow become controversial to say that they do, even though these are all like physically existing materials that have different conductive properties that have been measured in laboratory settings over and over and over again. And then of course you weave different strands together in different ways and you change conductive properties again. Like the science on whether or not these things actually make a difference was settled about 50 years ago, actually probably more like 70 or 80 years ago. Um, they do because a, physically, a physical entity that is an electromagnetic energy has to travel along these conductors, okay? Along these conductors, which will conduct that electromagnetic energy differently. Physicists have known this. Engineers, honestly, also have known that basic stuff for like between 80 and 100 years. And somehow that reality is only controversial in our hobby. I don't know, okay? So the question is not whether these do make a difference. Is, is, it, is the difference audible? And for certain on this headphone, it absolutely is because the treble response changes quite dramatically 
with the different cables. The stock cable, which I threw off, off camera, really harms the sound profile on this. It really, really does. It makes them very uncomfortable to listen to at any kind of volume for any length of time. The X8 does chill out the treble quite a bit with most amplifiers. Um, this one has a way of doing that with a lot of headphones. Helps chill out the treble response on the radiance. It takes my Hi-Fi Min HE1000SE and the HE1000V2, uh, the Stealth Magnet Edition, takes some of that treble energy, really tames it down and smooths it out a little bit. Okay, the Lavra cable here maintains a lot of the brightness of the 109, which the brightness isn't inherently a problem, maintains a lot of the brightness, but smooths out the response. It gets a lot less peaky and piercing, okay? Uh, the problem is both of these things are north of $400 shipped by the time you get them brand new, by the time you get them to your home. The, the 200, I see, like 215 for the, the corpse cable i think see gladiator is based in in italy and so i think this one is around 245 euro which is probably i don't know what exactly the exchange rate is but it's probably between like 260 280 us dollars because of that okay those don't even fit the heart is okay Right, it does a fairly decent job sonically uh, with these, but like, I mean, the, the, the plus sound and the laver cable are clearly better, but this one at least makes them mostly listenable and enjoyable with most music and is reasonably priced and it fits. So anyway, back to, if you're gonna make a bad cable, if you're gonna package this with a bad cable, make it easy to find aftermarket cables. Okay, because you're going to have to factor in the cost of the cable um, if you're going to buy this headphone. Okay, did I beat that dead horse enough? Probably. All right, let's move on to other things. So just to quick wrap all that up on the ergonomic and build package and all of that, it's just worth like summing up real quick. You have a very easy to drive and therefore transportable friendly headphone that is incredibly well built it looks great it's quite comfortable and uh the really the biggest drawback to the ergonomic package is just the cabling the stock cable is bad the uh recessed jacks here if or the cabling are too small and too deep to accommodate a wide range of aftermarket cables so it's a one-two punch there of having a bad stock cable and then also uh, having the extra challenge of finding aftermarket cables that will fix this, which is going to inflate the ultimate take-home cost of uh, this headphone here. And so that's something that you need to keep in mind. So with all of that, let's turn our attention to sound. And I will list the test gear that I used uh, for this piece here because it is quite plentiful uh, here. So to test the easy ease of drive ability here, or the easy driving nature of it, I used the Hedis S9 Pro, powered right off of my Samsung Galaxy S21, S22 Plus, excuse me, smartphone, which is doing the filming of this video right now. Powered that just fine. The source there, I wasn't really looking for a whole lot of detail. I just used Spotify, just wanted to see if that device would power it appropriately, and it does. Again, really easy to drive here. All right, then I would use local lossless or high-res FLAC files uh, or COBAs, high-res high res and lossless FLAC file streams or local DSD files on my KN N6 Mark II DAP with EO2 module, which is another example, again, like that drove this just fine too. So again, transportable friendly at least, and then scaled up the transportability to my Cord Hugo 2 with the 2Go streamer, sourced from using Rune, and again, lossless uh, local DSD, Koba streaming, FLAC, all of that kind of stuff applies there too. <clears throat> okay, for desktop signal chains, 
I used what I would kind of consider like a real world kind of signal chain for a, that lands in about the price range that I would expect a lot of people to use source gear for an 800 US dollar headphone. And that is the Gishelli J2S DAC, which I am working on a review for. It's coming up in the not too distant future. Okay. All right. Uh, the Gishelli J2S DAC with the Sparkos op amps in it, which with that option runs around the $500 price point right there. And then <clears throat> for the uh, the matching amp to that, I used my Lake People G111 Mark II, which is a $600 uh, headphone amplifier right there. And again, I consider that chain kind of a real world, realistic kind of chain pricing uh, and price and performance wise that would probably drive an $800 headphone out there in the wild. Okay. Um, so that was kind of my real world analysis. I did a couple of scale up signal chains with the Gustard R26 feeding my Headamp GSX Mini. And then uh, I also brought out the big guns, the Berkeley Alpha Series 2 feeding the Vioelectric HPA V281. For most of the critical listening, I used my heart cable on this, although I did try some of the other cables to see what they would do. So most of the sonic impressions that you're going to hear are from using the heart cable. One exception to that is when I did the comparison with the Aria, I got out the uh, Plus Sound X8 cable and then I used my Cord Hugo 2 with Tugo Streamer uh, to feed my Urzatich Perfidus uh, amplifier and then used the Plus Sound X8 because it's a uh, single ended in its configuration to drive both of these headphones in that comparison there. So <clears throat> that was the, uh, those are the signal chains. So let's get to the sound. All right which is what we're all here for and what is going to go the lion's share of the way towards telling us like, is the Meze 109 Pro hype train the real deal or is it just another hype train? Perceived frequency response. And I've mentioned this already in this review. This is a bright headphone. There is a lot of treble energy, particularly up in the air frequencies. It, uh, it is not overly sibilant. There is a little bit of sibilant, so there's not really a peak or anything around in that consonant range to give you those sharp S's and T's and that sort of thing. But the air frequencies way up around like 10 to 12K, maybe up to 15K and all that are elevated um, much more than most headphones. And so that really tilts the whole tonality to my ear anyway a little bit towards the brighter end of the spectrum. So it always sounds a little bit bright to me, regardless of what signal chain I was having it on or what cable I was using. There is also a little bit of a bump in the mid bass. I kind of centered around 100 hertz or so. There is a little bit of a bump there that would be above like the Harman neutral curve. And I'm not saying the Harman neutral curve is a good or bad, just as a reference point to establish something at resembling neutral. There's a little bit of excess mid bass energy there around 100 hertz or so that gives this thing some good weight and body to its sound to go along with that brightness. So there is a little bit of a V shape to the overall signature, at least from a perceptive standpoint. It's not a really deep V. It's not like a Fuzztex uh, TH900 series kind of V shape. It's not like that, but it is just because of the slight elevation there around 100 hertz and then the air frequencies. It's like this really wide V shape there. There is decent sub bass extension. So uh, frequency extension in the low end is okay. It does roll off a little bit once you get down below about 50, 60 hertz or so, but it's not all that bad. Um, it rolls off a little bit more than some other dynamic drivers, but it definitely doesn't roll off as bad as some do. So there is some rumble and grunt down low there as well. The mid range, the entirety of the mid range is well tonally balanced. There really aren't any peaks or dips in that through the mids that created audible shout or honk to me. So there was very good tonal balance through the mids. It's just the entirety of the mid range range seemed a bit lowered in terms of the perceptive level with that mid bass bump that I was telling you about and then those air frequencies up there. The treble is also for the most part well tonally balanced up until you get to about that 10K range where the air frequencies really start to come in again. And the air frequencies again are a little bit forward. All that, so the treble is fairly well tonally 
balanced. Again, it's not really peaky or have any noticeable dips or anything like that, but it does, and again, it just the whole sound profile, the whole tonality of it, again, does tilt a little bit bright overall in the presentation. Okay, so that is the perceived frequency response to my ear. So while we're on this tonality, let's talk about timbre. The timing aspects here are pretty good. So the attack and the decay, there are some fun dynamics here. There's some nice quick snap to snare drum hits and all of that, like that mid bass that I was just talking about that has a slight elevation. There's also some good thump in there, some, some nice physicality and hit to it. So there's a fun and lively aspect to the sound that comes with the timing nature of it and the dynamics. So putting together the tonality that I described and then the timing nature that I just talked about there, to me, those two things together are what create timbre a lot. The timbre is pretty solid in the bass and in the mids, mostly, uh, generally speaking, and then it just tilts a little bit bright overall because of that excess air there. So string instruments are where I hear this the most. They sound fairly natural for the most part, but they just sound just a hair bright and thin and just a little bit tinny to me compared to what I would consider to be their natural sound. So violins, cellos, okay, other woodwind instruments through their clarinets and especially flutes and things like that. It just even guitar string, like acoustic guitars and all of that, just everything sounds a little bit brighter and thinner than the real world sound to my ear because of that slightly excess energy. So uh, excess treble air energy. So the timbre is overall good, but just, just slightly hurt, I think, by that airy brightness, tilting everything up, giving it just a little bit of a thin sound in comparison to real life. Now, that said, once you get past that, vocals sound pretty natural and all that. Like again, it avoids shoutiness and honkiness and that sort of thing. But if you are a person who likes your vocals kind of up front and to stand out, this headphone's not gonna do it for you because that mid-range range is uh, brought a little bit lower in comparison to that mid-bass bump and that treble air. <clears throat> okay, now, <clears throat> resolution. Decent, but not spectacular. For an $800 headphone, it sounds to me like it is appropriately resolving, but maybe a little bit on the lower end of like what we should expect for $800. So it hints at things like being able to present the, uh, the sounds of fingers, like the transients of fingers plucking bass guitar strings. Like that was one thing that I consistently noticed, like they were there, but they weren't super clear or uh, well pulled out. Room reverbs, again, are there, but they are a little bit like mushier and like amorphous kind of sounding where they don't quite have as much of a distinct like, here's where it is, here's where it's come from, and then also like here's the time delay in there um, between the actual sound and then the reflected sound, all that. So, but then again, like never did I get the sense that it was underperforming in terms of resolution for an $800 headphone. It just wasn't standing out to me as like, this is a class leader in resolution. Soundstage and spatial stuff. Let's talk about that. The soundstage is very wide. Like in terms of the width of the stage, this is a meaningful challenger to the big egg-shaped hi fimans right? Which have an enormous soundstage, all that. So in terms of the width dimension, it's up there challenging those. It has been a long time since I've heard the Sennheiser HD 800 series, but it would not surprise me if the 109 Pro was of similar width to the HD 800 series as well. The depth here is noticeable, but not great. Um, which again is pretty common for $800 headphones and the, the you know, there's not a ton of height either. So it's not truly three dimensional or holographic, but it's also like, it's not bad. The imaging here, good job of placing sounds in the positive sense. Like where are they? And a, an okay, but not outstanding job of placing space between those, like doing the separation aspect. And so this, I think, overlaps with resolution a lot too, is one thing that I noticed is that this headphone is okay at both spatial separation and then like instrument, instrument and vocal separation. 
it is okay about putting space between sounds in terms of the, the spatial presentation and the sonic imaging and all of that. It is okay about putting an orchestra out in front of you and telling you the difference between like, okay, there's a violin here and a violin there and all of that. And then over here we have the violas and the cellos and like then the flutes, like it is okay at all of that stuff, but it's not like elite for the price point either. All right. So, um, listening to this headphone on its own, I did, for the most part, enjoy it. There are some tracks that can just get too bright and a little bit fatiguing, regardless of which signal chain and uh, cable that I'm trying to use. Basically, with the stock cable, everything is too bright and, and fatiguing. The heart cable really helped a lot and made these listenable for longer periods of time and all of that. Um, I found that poorly recorded stuff does get, you know, that is already uh, peaky and sibilant and all that can get very fatiguing really quickly. One example that's coming up to mind and that I used as a comparison track, which unfortunately is not available on all of the streaming surface, um, services, is the uh, cover of Heroes by David Bowie. That was done by the Wallflowers. That was part of the, the 1998 Godzilla film soundtrack. That track, I really like the song. The Wallflowers did a great cover of that, but it's just really brightly recorded. And so it's uh, like tracks like that do not do well on the 109 because of its already bright signature uh, just brings out that harshness in that track and the fatiguing nature of its treble presentation and its sibilance and all of that, um, even more so than a lot of other headphones okay, that uh, come out. But as long as things are well recorded and there's not a ton, at least for me, there is not a ton of upper air like energy or a lot of really rapid fire aggressive cymbal hits, this headphone is quite enjoyable. Even those stringed instruments can sound a little bit too thin in comparison to other headphones that I think are a little bit more timbrely accurate. I still, for the most part, most part enjoyed symphonic works on this headphone as well. Okay, so uh, some people just like brighter presentations. I don't have a problem with brightness as a general rule. It's just that the brightness here was not fully balanced out by the weight and body of the lower end sometimes um, here. All right, so I think that is a fair amount about the, the sound of the, the 109 Pro here. Let's get to the comparisons and then we'll, we'll talk about where it fits in with the market. Let's start with the little bit more like apples and apples comparisons about the like and like. So Focal Elex, which I reviewed, oh, well, it's been a while ago now. I'll put a link to it, but of a friend of mine was going to sell this one and I asked him to uh, if I could borrow it before he sold it so that I could compare it to this because I wanted a good dynamic driver open back reference point that a lot of people have heard to compare the 109 Pro to. So the current price of the Elex is 750 US dollars. So 750, 800, both dynamic driver open backs. Seems like a pretty good comparison. All right. The Eagle X does not have the soundstage size that the 109 brings. So the 109 stage is a lot bigger if that is important to you. I think the 109 is actually, even though it's not elite at its, uh, its separation and all of that, did it a little bit better yet than the Elex did. The Elex has a little bit more mid-range energy, so if you like vocals to stand out, that will, you know, these will push the vocals ahead just a little bit. These are a more chill in the air frequencies though, so um, it didn't have the brightness of timbre to me that the, the 109 Pro does. I will say though that even that there is a little bit of a treble peak here in the Elex around in the vocal in the consonant range that does give it some sibilance, some sharp S's and T's, and that sort of thing, much more often than happens on the 109 Pro. I, I do think that between the two of these, I did actually lean towards the Meze. I the Elex has been kind of that, you know, seven to eight hundred dollar like or a seven to eight hundred dollar open back dynamic reference now for a period of several years and it's still a, a very good headphone but I think that the market has caught up and you know and surpassed it though just barely and the 109 Pro I think is one of those headphones that just edges it out 
in terms of total sonic technicalities and all of that. Um, even though the tuning is, is, again, quite remarkably different. I also think the Elax is a little bit more dynamic and impactful because that is a focal trait. Okay. Um, all that. So some will still prefer the Elex, even though I think on a technical level, the 109 Pro is just a hair superior. All right, I have not fully reviewed the next one yet, and that is the Aurorus Borealis. Okay, this is a $900 open back dynamic driver headphone, and again, I am working on a full review of this one. This one somehow remarkably manages to stage even bigger yet than the... Um, the 109 Pro. And I don't know if it's necessarily because it's wider, but it does depth and height a little bit better than the 109 Pro does. So it just sounds a little bit bigger. And then it's a little bit a little bit better in the separation aspects, the spatial separation and the instrument and the vocal separation. So it sounds a little bit more holographic and 3D in its presentation. It uh, does not have the, the airiness that the 109 Pro does. So it doesn't tilt its timbre up towards the bright end of the spectrum like the 109 Pro does. It has a little bit better overall bass performance, I think, a little bit more dynamic impact in the low end. Around 100 hertz, I would say they have similar uh, amounts of presence in terms of the level of bass that is there, but I think the Borealis also extends down a little bit deeper and gets a little bit more grunt and rumble, and it also has more texturing uh, to the bass. It's a, it's a more resolving headphone, not hugely, but it's noticeably more resolving than the 109 Pro is. Now, the, the downer of a little bit in comparison, again, not bad in a universal sense, but in comparison is that the mid-range timbre on the 109 Pro, even with that brightness that comes in because of the airiness, is a little bit better than it is on the Borealis. The Borealis has a little bit of above neutral energy right around like 1.5-ish kilohertz, I want to say, which brings the uh, brings vocals out a little bit and makes them just a tad hollow sounding. Not really shouty or honky in an absolute sense, but in comparison to this, like I preferred the mid-range timbre of the 109 Pro to the Borealis, um, just because of that slightly extra um, energy there. This, the Borealis is also super easy to drive, um, so it's not really different than the 109 Pro is or that, but I mean, it. if you look at just how they're, they're built and like all of that, like uh, the 109 Pro, fits on the head a little bit tighter without being uncomfortable where this one can slide around and then this one is just harder to transport it comes in a much bigger hard shell case which i will show you when the full review comes around and all of that so if you are needing a headphone that is easy to transport the 109 pro is going to be more ergonomically friendly um, in that way okay so those are the two open back dynamic drivers um, that i wanted to compare the 109 pro to the other three are the high and planars, and some are going to grumble about me comp comparing a dynamic driver to a planar. It's like, you know, different tech, they're going to have different sounds and all of that. But the reason that I'm going to do it is because, like, these are all priced near-ish, the $800 of the 109 Pro now, and that's going to help us establish, like, is this just an $800 headphone? Is it overpriced, or is it, does it really punch above its weight? Okay, let's get some market context from these Hi-Fi Men's because in my opinion, Hi-Fi Men is kind of the leader at most price points right now in terms of all around performance in their open back planar headphones right now. All right, let's start with the Ananda Stealth Magnet Edition. Right now here in the summer of 2023, this is 550 US dollars. It was at 700 US dollars for a while, okay, for a, quite a while. Now I know there is the Ananda Nano out there right now. No, I don't have it in yet. Yes, I do think hi -Fi Man is gonna send me one when they have one available, so please be patient. I will get to it when I can. But I think more people are familiar with this one right now than they are the Ananda Nano because the Nando, the Nano is so new. Okay. The 109 Pro here, the advantages that it has over the Ananda SE. I think it is better built. I don't know if it necessarily has a comfort advantage, and I think it also just it looks nicer, right? It has a, an aesthetic appeal that this one does not. 
the 109 Pro is easier to drive. Even though the Ananda SE is pretty easy to drive and, and friendly for most mobile amps, it's plain our nature does present a little bit more challenging of a load than the dynamic driver is, you know, the fairly low impedance dynamic driver does here. Okay, if that matters to you there. The, uh, they are very similar in terms of soundstage width, because again, the 109 Pro is very wide. Hi-Fi Men's egg-shaped planar designs throw a very wide soundstage too. The Ananda, though, is still a little bit more three-dimensional, and it's all around uh, sonic presentation. You get more depth, you get more height. It does a better job of putting uh, space between instruments, like doing spatial and instrument separation from each other. So it's just a little bit more three-dimensional, a little bit more holographic in its sound. It also has a little bit more resolution. Those, uh, those transients that I had talked about of like bass guitar string plucks come out a little bit more clearly on the Ananda. The Ananda SE also does not have that error problem. So yes, it has the high fi and treble presentation, which usually can be reined in pretty well with signal chain. But it doesn't tilt the whole thing bright like this one can. So I, it also has better bass extension and bass texturing and a little bit more sub bass rumble to it. I do think that overall, all things considered, this is the better headphone than the 109 Pro in terms of sound quality. The HE6 SEV2, the reason this one here is because it is frequently on that ridiculous Adorama sale. What did it get down to? Like 450 or something like that? Like just crazy how cheap it got. Um, not quite as big in the stage. So like this one again, like the 109 Pro is wider. It is much, much, much easier to drive than the HE6 SEV2 is. Like the HE6 series is notorious for the difficulty it is of driving it. Okay, so very easy to drive and all of that. Um, the dynamics here come out a little bit more, but this one is far more resolving, far more holographic in its spatial presentation, all of that. Um, the overall superior sounding headphone, quite frankly, um, and it's quite noticeable, jumps out right away. It is a much heavier headphone too, and like I have added a lobe strap to help with that. So there are comfort issues here that need to be uh, mitigated that uh, with the HE6 SE that the 109 Pro does not have. Aria, why is this one here? Well, it is currently uh, here in the summer of 2022, 2023, excuse me, on sale. And I think this will be its price until this model is gone of 999 US dollars. So just under a thousand dollars, which is not all that far in price from the 109 Pro. And this is a clear step up. Um, much like the HE6 SE V2 is, but even more so. Like this one brings back the width of the sound stage. It has a much better, much more, uh, a, a much better tonality and timbre to it, much more resolution and separation and, and a holo holography to the spatial presentation. It is not quite as dynamic as the 109 Pro or the HE6 SE, but it is not far behind anymore. Okay, um, this is the superior headphone, really, uh, in terms of technical ability and all that. Doesn't mean you have to like it more than the 109 Pro, but this is the better sounding headphone easily. Again, more resolution, more holographic uh, spatial presentation, a more three-dimensional soundstage, a uh, better timbre, better overall tonality, uh, like all of that kind of stuff. It is a clear step up. The last thing that I will drop in here, and I don't have it to show ahead of you, but it is my closed back Focal Radiance, which is $1,300. Um, and that one has, a, has um, it's not going to sound, stage is big, but it is going to bring the Focal Dynamics that this comes close to, but doesn't quite get to. And it is a much more lush uh, and natural timbre and tonality to it, but also like it's more resolving than the 109 Pro is as well with better bass extension and a more natural presentation to it as well. So why do I bring up the Aria in the Radiance there? Uh, because a lot of people out there are claiming that the, the Meze 109 Pro punches up, that it really outperforms its $800 price point and reaches up into that next tier and you know performs with the Arias, the Radiance, the Clears and all that. Like they, they're saying it just, it punches above its weight and above its price. 
That gets claimed so many times about so many pieces of gear, and it's really rarely ever true, okay? This is a hobby where, by and large, you do get what you pay for. There are rare exceptions in both directions, okay? The HD6XX, for example, and the Bayer DT880, like those are examples of, of headphones that punch above their, their price point, okay? Shit Asgard 3 amplifier does the same, in my opinion. But then there are also examples going, you know, the other way. Examples I gave from Meze early on in the Hi-Fi Men Audivino, where it's like, no, those are in no way worth the amount of money that they are asking for. So those somewhat rare exceptions in both directions aside, in this hobby, you by and large get what you pay for. And I'm gonna put the 109 Pro in that category. You get what you pay for here. It is about an $800 headphone when you put together the build quality, the aesthetic, the accessories package, the sound quality, both from a, a subjective and objective uh, standpoint on that, like $800 does sound about right, okay? Do keep in mind though that you're probably dropping at least $70 if you go the heart cable system to get a cable that where you actually hear that. So, more like a $900 setup. But even then, I get it. And for me to say that, that is something because my experience with Meze has been that they are far behind the competition on the price performance metric. This one did not run out ahead as many claim, but it is right there in the price performance. I think it is a very complete and very solid $800, close to $900 when you get a cable unit. And I think from me, that should mean a lot because of my previous experience with Meze. So, should we all jump on the hype train? Not really. I think we need to pump the brakes on that um, hype train a little bit. It's a train, so pumping the brakes doesn't really make sense. But let's, let's slow that hype train down a little bit and not just all jump on it. Is this a good headphone? Yes. Do I enjoy listening to it? Yes, I do. Is it perfect? No. Is it punching above his weight, its weight and reaching above and challenging a more expensive competition? No. No, that's not. And I think that's where we need to stop this hype train business around this unit. It is a solid choice that should be considered if you like brighter presentations and are looking for an open back headphone somewhere between $700 and $1,000. This should be on your list to audition and give serious consideration for. Okay. And that's where I will leave it here with the 109 Pro. I know that took a lot of time, but I hope it was useful and good information. So I'm going to leave it there. I am Wave Theory. Thanks for watching this review of the Meze 109 Pro. Um, if you are interested in buying this, please consider using the affiliate link that I have for APOS Audio down below. And you know what? Maybe throw in one of their uh, APOS Flow cables in there since you got to buy a new cable anyway. Maybe it'll work great. Maybe it won't. But somebody please report back to me on that one. Okay. Um, but otherwise, please like this video. If you haven't, leave a comment down below to let me know what you think. Uh, check out my PayPal. Check out my Patreon to see how you can support the channel. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. You know, generally do those things you do to support YouTube channels. And as always, enjoy the music.